Okay, welcome everyone to um, this month's um, Research Ready Mentor Spotlight. Really excited to um, hear today's topic and uh, you'll find out why in a minute. Um, we are talking about uh, challenges and learnings from Stop Cove, uh, which was a decentralized clinical trial. Um, you don't know until you know, and Rosie will be sharing with us um, all kinds of obstacles that came out of nowhere and her solutions and, and um, practices to, um, you know, uh, deal with those. So great to have you here. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with Research Ready, a Mentor Spotlight series, um, you can look up on our website, on the Clinical Trial Ontario website, um, all kinds of uh, different things we put together for research coordinators and staff. Um, specifically, we are looking to share best practices in this particular series from people who are experts on particular topics. So um, we always want it to be relevant to the Ontario and Canadian uh, research staff, as well as live and interactive um, during our live sessions. We make this available online um, on demand, uh, and you'll see that if you go to the website posted below. We also have a certificate of attendance for anyone that's here today live. We just ask you to complete a very short survey at the end, and this uh, starts the process for us to um, document your attendance and then also um, create a certificate for you for those of you who are um, collecting continuing education credits. So um, just hold when the um, call is done and a screen will pop up and you can, I think there's five quick questions. So um, also we'd love to hear from you in that survey, anything that you are looking for in terms of topics and of course, just your overall feedback. So um, we'll really welcome any of that feedback regardless of the certificate. So today we are very lucky to have Rosemary Clark join us and, and share her expertise with us. Um, Rosemary is a registered nurse with a bachelor's of science degree in nursing and a master's in health management. She has certifications as a clinical research professional with the Society of Clinical Research Associates, SOCRA, and a certified health executive with the College of um, Canadian College Health Leaders. Rosie currently holds the position of clinical research manager and project manager at UHN. And she specializes in clinical research operations. She's coordinated and managed many studies and many therapeutic areas in all phases of clinical trial. The specialty has positioned her to be the project manager of several COVID studies, which you'll hear about one of them today. Rosie is instrumental in the startup and implementation of this decentralized study called Stop Cove, and currently oversees a research team of investigators, coordinators, and analysts. I would also like to add that Rosie is um, a newer member of our Research Ready Advisory Group, and we really appreciate that she's uh, chosen to contribute her expertise to um, this program in a number of different ways. So uh, welcome, Rosie. Um, in terms of housekeeping, I, would, uh, I think what we want is uh, a lot of interaction, so feel free to ask a lot of questions in the chat. If you'd prefer to ask live, just put your hand up and then Rosie can um, address you just at a natural pause. Um, so we can address that throughout or also at the end too, we'll try and leave a little bit of time. Okay, over to you. Hi everybody. Um, am I able to share my screen now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully everybody can see that. And thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Don't let the padded intro fool you. It's a lot more glory than, than what's here. I'm just me and I'm Rosie. So um, I'm gonna be talking to you about um, our Stop Coast study. Um, the objective that I'm hoping to accomplish today is um, first go over the role of what a decentralized clinical trial is or looks like. And then I am going to tell the story of our journey um, with the Stop Coast study, and through that, identify some um, some of the limitations and challenges that we um, that we experienced. And it shouldn't have said limitations; it should have said um, successes as well as challenges associated with DCTs. And from there, I'll discuss um, some best practices that we've learned um, when conducting. Um, 
um, decentralized clinical trials. And you'll hear me interchangeably say um, just DCTs or decentralized trials or decentralized clinical trials. How I hope to do this is by, like I said before, going over and uh, doing an overview of DCTs, going through our stop code study, talking about the planning, startup, implementation, and, and share a little bit of the results um, of what happened with when, when launching the study um, and identify some best practices. And then hopefully we will have some opportunities for questions and answers at the end. So let's start. So clinical trials um, typically are centralized. They're uh, what we would call, you know, our traditional way of doing clinical trials, which is where the researcher collects data um, in a centralized location, such as, you know, a hospital where I'm at or a clinic setting, or um, it could be a pharmacy or it could be a, a, a lab somewhere. And the patient or the participant typically has to travel to the location from wherever they are and provide the data that is required, whether it be from questionnaires, whether it be um, samples, um, whatever it is that's required for that particular study. So on the other flip coin, on the flip side of the coin, there's your decentralized clinical trials, which has been around for a bit, but has been slowly being um, embraced in the clinical trial world, where the participants basically stay in their homes and everything comes to them. So enrollment, um, consenting, monitoring, and collecting data, participants are able to do this from their home. And in, men, in a lot of situations, especially in interventional trials, um, uh, the care team is deployed to the participant's home uh, or, or the study team. And if there's um, uh, pharmaceuticals involved, that can be delivered there. Virtual trials, is it's a form of decentralized trials, but there is no in-person interactions. Um, any visits would be done by video or phone, and it requires the utilization of digital tools and devices. So that, that's an overview of your, um, de your decentralized clinical trials. The ideal is to make it participant friendly by going, making it more convenient for the participant and easier for them to participate. Um, the, the hope is that it will bring in a significant proportion of trial activities um, to the participant um, instead of us going through the traditional paradigm of them coming to us and the hope is then that this is um, better for them and will um, improve recruitment and, and, and the data collected. So that's this is just a, um, we have here, you know, a pictorial like a diagram of the decentralized and the traditional uh, clinical trial. So of course, with the COVID pandemic, um, we we experienced in 20, starting in, well, we heard about it in late 2019, but really, really in 2020, when everything just started to lock down, our health system resources became constrained, travel was limited because of this um, physical distancing, and therefore patients' access to trial sites was significantly reduced. I remember we shut down to, I think, about 80% um, of our activities got shut down at one point. And of course, there was a decline, a significant decline in trial activities. Because of this, this um, catalyzed um, DCTs. Um, sponsors, investigators had to quickly mobilize to ensure that there was um, that continuity of care and, and data integrity was preserved. And therefore, a majority of trial activities became um, remote and was conducted in participants' homes. And we started to implement things such as remote consents, um, in-home um, phlebotomy, and so on. At the same time, we were still having participants maybe going to off-sites, not in the hospital, and so it wasn't really fully remote. In addition to that, we had the public health response to the COVID um, pandemic, and we had the we had the rollout of vaccines, and um, of course, we, there were multiple brands, um, and there were different dosing intervals, and of course. Um, 
in Canada, we allowed for mixing of brands and we also allowed for, um, there were different time points with the dosing intervals of the, the vaccines. So with all this going on, you know, our, we, we, you know, we came up with our research question and we wanted to look at what the immune response would be to the COVID vaccines. We were interested in looking at older individuals and their response um, in relation to or relative to younger individuals. And therefore, um, the team came up with studying the safety and immunogenicity of COVID-19 vaccines in person 70 years and over relative to the younger group. Um, and the age we chose was, um, the age chosen was between the ages of 30 and 50. And of course, with the lockdown and everything, we, we recognized that we would we wanted to do this in a community, um, in the community at the participants' home and where they wouldn't have to come in. So why would we want to do a study like this? Well, the target group, as we know, is at a high risk for um, severe illness and death from COVID-19. And they are also likely to have single or multiple comorbidities. Uh, we would be able to provide safety data in the real world. Um, we would be able to, we're hoping to determine the serologic response in this particular population, look at how long um, that response lasts and uh, um, and also de determine any correlation to breakthrough infections should we have them. And as I alluded to before, the um, in Canada, there were delays between to several different kinds of delays between doses. And there was also the allowance of mixing of brands, which in turn um, affected people because as vaccines were rolling out, then people um, started wanted to who wanted to travel or who had to travel um, they had to be careful with mixing up brands because there were several countries that were not allowing that um, for entry into their country. So we felt that this study would really provide a lot of important and, and valuable information. So of course, we decided that we wanted to design our, a fully virtual study, which would include electronic contact about the study. Um, there would be signing up online, um, confirmation of eligibility, consenting, and whatever criteria or data that we needed, which included questionnaires, diaries, collection of samples. We decided on dry blood spots, um, monthly check-ins, and we would pro also provide participants with their results. So where do we start? That's a lot that we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to accomplish it in a short amount of time. And the times, the time frames got shorter with every changing um, uh, rule or regulation from the government. We also wanted to ensure that we had, we, we had, um, you know, we were clinically efficient with the study but not at the expense of the patient. And we also wanted to ensure that the patient had a good experience, but not at the expense of clinical efficiency. So we had to put our minds together to figure out where we went from here. So logistically, we figured out with a short time frame that we would require funding, we would require regulatory approval, we would definitely require technic um, technological build and support, we would need somewhere or some way to get the supplies to the participant and have them send it back to us. Um, we definitely have to do have a really robust recruitment strategy. And as people enroll, we wanted to ensure at the same time that we wanted that they we could retain them in the study. And we wanted to make sure that we had adequate resources um, to, to support the, the operations of the study. So what do you do? Well, the first thing you do, I, I would say is that you try to put yourself in the different shoes of the uh, um, uh, of different departments. And you also try to learn from others. So we went, um, we were doing things simultaneously. Um, the investigate, uh, um, our investigator, she was, you know, writing the protocol and, and that was put in place. We had to work on an e-consent that would be, um, we felt would be approved. We also needed to look at, we wanted to look at whether other places or other institutions were doing something similar to what we were thinking of. And so I have here the ABC study because by looking, we found that the ABC study was already doing a study on COVID, look, utilizing um, dry blood spot samples. 
And so they already had the operations in place and the logistics in place of getting it to participants and getting it back. So we, you know, we spoke with them and they were gracious in helping us and showing us how they, they managed to do that. So we learned from them. We set up meeting with the, meetings with the digital teams, with our digital team. And we also you know, reached out to the REB. We reached out to contracts to say, hey, this is what we're doing. It's new, it's novel. We think it's really good. How can you help us get this done? So we had preliminary meetings with the REBs. We tried to anticipate what kind of questions they would have, and we implemented that in our consent. So when we sat down to speak with them, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide. Um, you know, some of the questions they had was, well, um, how will you know, for example, that participants will understand what they're reading if it's done remotely. And we had anticipated that. So we, we, we discussed building in some um, questions in, into the consent form that they would answer online. Um, the REB actually, I, or some team member mentioned um, digit, building the digital platform because they wanted to know about that. They mentioned that, you know, well, there, we have REDCap in place and they have an e-consent, but we wanted something more sophisticated. So we went with um, the UHN digital team that's called Data. And I'll talk to that. I'll, I'll speak on that a little bit more um, in another slide. And we also met with privacy because we recognize that as we're shipping things to people, we'll have their names, their addresses, and that's a lot of personal health, personal information. And so we wanted to make sure that everybody's on board. We discussed with contracts because we wanted them to be very much aware of the timelines that we had and wanted to make sure that they were able and had the, the personnel to be able to, dedicated personnel to be able to help us to get this all um, going in a quick time frame. So based on that, and after all those discussions, and I can tell you that as exhaustive as they were, they were extremely valuable because they helped us to um, mobilize, this, mobilize this study quite quickly. So we, we were able to get funding um, from three um, institutions, the COVID Immunity Task Force, UHN Foundation, um, the CIHR. Um, regulatory, we, um, we met with the REB, we did our submissions, we, had, um, uh, we answered the questions that they had and um, we were able to get um, the turnaround times for approval was really remarkable. For the REB, it was two weeks for the initial uh, the initial protocol uh, for contracts was a little bit longer because of the different organizations that we needed contracts with. Uh, we met with the UHN data aggregation translation and architectural team, which we'll call which, and they just go by data, data, and human factors. And they were helped us design, build, and they have been supporting this study from the get go. We, through ABC, the ABC study, we um, connected with Marketing Kitchen and they were responsible for sending out the kits to the participants um, in a quick turnaround time, a buy bulk. And um, we also had an agreement with them because of course, um, how would we share that private private data? So there, you know, there was a secure portal where we shared that information. Recruitment, um, we linked up with the Ministry of Health, and uh, we also had a connection with Zoomer Magazine, which I will talk about later um, briefly. And um, then, of course, with retention, we recognized that we would always have to be available for technical support, and um, communication would be key. And then for communication with the teams, because there were so many stakeholders involved, uh, we had weekly meetings. And for participants, we had a dedicated um, phone line, uh, uh, which is 1-844-623-STOP, and a dedicated email address, which is stopcoba.uhn.ca. And then for lab processing, we connected with the Linenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute at Sinai Health Institute. Uh, at Sinai. So this is the template that we came up with. I'm not going to spend much time on that, but just because it's hard for you to see, but I will just review that, you know, recruitment. We had the um, Canadian Association of Retired Persons, which is um, affiliated with the Zoomer magazine. 
um, the vaccine registration sites with the Ministry of Health. We also had pamphlets and posters that didn't go so well simply because of all the lockdowns and GP offices were closed and so on and so forth. And we developed our website. Um, we, after getting approval, we had to send screenshots and, and so on to the REB so that they could get an idea of what it would look like. And we got our approval. And from there, um, the blue section is where participants would register, read, e-consent, and they would be given their own ID. They, get, they um, actually created their own passwords. And um, then the logistics of it is that they would send, they would collect their dry blood spot, fill out their baseline questionnaire and their diaries. The um, all of this would eventually end up in the StopCove database. And we also built, our statisticians built, uh, one of our statisticians built um, a red cap database for us to collect the lab samples as the participants would send them to our lab here at UHN. We would make sure that um, the, the specimens were intact and that there were no identifying factors on the, on the cards before we sent them over to the lab. And from there, um, we would send that disseminate um, information to um, whoever needed it or required it at the time as per, as per our protocols and as per our agreements with the different funding agencies. And our graphic team helped us build our logo and we came up with Stop Cove, which is safety and efficacy of preventative COVID vaccines. So first we have our approval and we, um, for recruitment, um, the first thing we decided was we would do this slowly because we weren't sure how people were gonna um, uh, gravitate to this and how, how recruitment um, enrollment would, would go. So the Canadian Association for Retired Persons um, puts out this magazine to people who are 50 and over. They have over 50,000 members across Ontario. And so we had an agreement with them as well. And we had an approved poster that um, they send out as an email blast. And this is something that they normally do. They send a lot of advertisement on financial security, healthcare, so on, and, and a lot of different issues. And they send it to send it out for um, to their to their members. And so that was our first mode. Actually, our first mode was to get a few key people who, um, small amount who would enroll so that we could troubleshoot after we dabbled in the playground that the digital um, department um, team members gave to us and to kind of troubleshoot any issues. Then we also um, partnered with the Ministry of Health because when people registered for vaccine as they went through, they um, some could agree to be contacted for research and others could refuse. And so for those who consent, consented to be um, um, contacted for research, we had an agreement again between UH and the Ministry of Health where via a secure portal, we would obtain the emails of those who consented to agree, but that met, but only those who, not just everybody who consented, but those who met the eligibility criteria. So they had about 50,000 people age 70 and over who agreed to be contacted and they had another 15,000 um, for the other age group between the ages of 30 to 50. And this was our poster that went out via the email blast. Um, in the bottom right corner, you'll see the little date stamp. So to show that, you know, we did have REB approval. And, you know, top part just says, you know, um, basically it was sent out via Zoomer email first and then it's subsequently via the MOH uh, list. So with all that said, who are we? Who is this team that Rosie keeps talking about? So there we have our group of investigators, which is led by Dr. Sharon Wamsley. And um, Dr. M. Gingras is um, the head of the, the, the lab at Mount Sinai. There's Dr. Roshan, Dr. Wooters, McGeer, and, um, and uh, Graham, and Dr. Michael Brudno, who is in charge of that um, data um, team that I was I was talking about and Dr. Oza. Um, our 
study coordinator extraordinaire Rizani and um, Queenie came along a little bit later to help her um, so that it can offload some work off of some of us because we realized that the amount of staff that we need as we were moving forward. We have our statisticians, our digital team extraordinaire, the DVS lab, and we had some summer students once we started to open up last year, a couple of summer students came on and they were helping us in the lab. So study overview. So this study is a longitudinal cohort study. It's, pro, it's a prospective study and it is observational, which makes it a little bit easier because it's not interventional. We don't have to worry about that, that little aspect of it. Um, initially, it was supposed to be a 48 week study and I kept this here um, for a reason. And we wanted a sample size of uh, 900, I believe, uh, over the age of 70 and 400. I believe at one point we thought we wanted 1,000, but that's what we have here. Um, there, to be eligible, you had to be age 70 years of age and over, or between the ages of 30 to 50. You would be receiving your first or second dose of, of COVID vaccine. Ideally, we wanted it to be the first, but because everything was happening so rapidly, we had to be able to be, we were a pliable team, I will say. And so we were able to, to, to change fairly quickly and get some amendments through quite quickly. And so we allowed for the first or second dose of a COVID vaccine at an Ontario distribution center. You had to be an Ontario resident. We had to do an amendment for that one as well. And um, read and understand English. And recognizing that we're dealing with an elderly population, we allowed, um, we allowed the, them to have a trusted individual to help with study procedures. Um, one of the things we didn't think of and we thought of later, and so we allowed for that again, that was another amendment, was that we had people who wanted to sign up who were going to be seven, who were not quite yet 70. Sometimes they were a day away, a week away, a month away, or maybe by the end of the year. So what we did was we allowed that anybody who was reaching the minimum age of requirement by the end of the recruitment calendar year would be allowed to participate. And what they had to do, as I said before, was, um, you know, complete a baseline questionnaire, um, complete a symptom diary after um, each vaccine dose in the beginning, um, obtain dry blood spot specimens, send it in, and also do monthly check-ins. And those monthly check-ins was basically asking, basically, have, to, have they experienced any other issues from the last time? Um, have they received a vaccine since the last time? Because some were between vaccine doses. And subsequently, of course, we had, we had booster doses. So this is a study procedure. They got this um, on their... Um, uh, on their, their portal as well on the website. And um, this just outlines what was required at each study. So yes, they had to do, a, you'll see a lot of X's on their DBS's, but after two weeks afterwards, it was really every three months. It's every three months. And so the process was that they would go into the website, which is www.stopcove.ca. They would receive information on the study there, and they could also access their portals from that website. The participants self-identified from the advertisements that they received or by word of mouth. There were some participants who put it on their Facebook page and so on. So, and people identified through that. Um, they checked their own, they did, went through to see if they were eligible. And if they were, they signed and they wanted to participate, they would read and sign the REB approved e-consent. Um, they were given a participant ID and they would access their portal using this PID and their chosen password. There were two videos on the website that explained what the consent process was because we recognized that many of our participants probably had never um, participated in a research study before. And, uh, and of course, we experienced where they asked us, why did it have to be so long? Why do we need to know all this detail? And the consent process actually does um, explain that to them. There was another video um, showing them also how to collect the dried blood spot specimen collection instructions. And I need to do a shout out. I don't even know if she's here or not, but to our investigator, uh, um, PI, Dr. Wamsley, who literally did it herself and had it videoed. And that was the demonstration that they saw. Because I wasn't going to put myself, so she did it. And when they logged in, so when you go on to stopcove.ca, this is the website that you see. 
and uh, um, uh, this is what you see first. And then you can either scroll down and you will see these different um, things about the study, eligibility, what is required, who we are, what news is, you know, any publications that we've done. And as we were going through, of course, we started to collect frequently asked questions. We put it in here with some answers for them and if they wanted to contact us. So this is when you go on the, um, the website about the study. This is the consent process and it's a nice little cartoon demo that talks about the consent process. It's not necessarily talking about the study. It really is giving participants information about what their rights are and you know and that they can refuse and you know that they should read this over and and why would why do we do clinical trials and so on and so forth and then this is a dry blood spot um, instruction video this is the eligibility information and they can click here they can click at the bottom here sign me up there's one for the for for the over 70 and there's one here for 30 to 50 and they can click up here too to say sign me up so when they go into their consent form this is just an example of what one will see um, as they go through you can see that there's a knowledge check um, you know, I have to participate in the study to receive the vaccine, true or false. They click it. If it's correct, it tells them that it, it tells them, yes, you're correct. And it again explains um, so that it's another feature for them to remember and to understand. One of the, the questions from the REB was, well, what if they don't understand? What if they get it wrong? Does that mean that they're not allowed into the study? And of course, um, when you're thinking about this study, you think about your GCP guidelines and your and, and, and the principles and so on. And when in the traditional setting, when you're explaining and going through a consent form with an individual, if they don't understand the, the, the uh, section of the consent form, nobody tells them that, okay, well, because you don't understand it, you need to go home, you can't participate. No, the coordinator or whoever is giving, going through the consent process would explain that at uh, that particular scenario and and ensure that they they've they've they understood so we explained to the REB that it's the same thing if they got the answer they didn't choose the correct answer it doesn't say incorrect what it says is the correct answer is and it does the same explanation so that's how what that's how we did that knowledge check um, this is an example of one of the questions in the symptoms diary so there's some uh, there's pictures and so on and so forth. And these are what the kits look like. So the brown envelope contains um, everything the participant would need for a kit. The white envelope is also in the kit and that's what, and it's or, it has a stamp on it. It has, it's already pre-addressed and they just slip their, their, their uh, DBS in there and send it back to us. They also get uh, in their kits the uh, an explanation, we, and we did we made sure that we um, credited the ABC study for for helping us with this. And um, so, in their kits, they receive alcohol wipes, they receive sterile gauze, they receive bandages. Excuse me, they receive lancets to 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 prick their fingers. They receive the blood spot cards, um, and the pouch and the return envelope, and the instructions. They also received a, a diary, a kind of paper diary with their schedule, which they could write on. But in their portal, they also received their schedule of when things were due. So this is, again, all the instructions. And this is what, if they log into their portal, these are the things they see. So on the left-hand side, you see is the home, symptoms diary, DBS specimens, results, monthly check-in, profile, so on and so forth. So this is, if you're collecting your DBS specimen, this is a schedule that um, tells you what's upcoming. And at the top, this, this is a schedule, at the top you would see what is due. Um, and in this case, and, and it also explains why we're doing this. Um, for the monthly check-in, this particular individual has, has done it. They also get email reminders for the DBS specimens. They get email reminders for their monthly check-in. And it just tells them come back later um, uh, and you, to do the next one. 
this, um, if you log in, um, when you initially log in, you you may or may not see something like this. This individual is three days overdue on their dry blood spot specimen, so they can start there. Now there is a cutoff date, uh, cutoff timeline. So that we found that there are some people who did actually collect it because we received it, but they didn't go in to, to log it in. So on the administrative side, we were able to update that information for them. And as a record and for a quality check, we would either ask them, do we have a log uh, that we document any changes that we made on the administrative site and why? And we, we've gotten our participants into the habit of emailing it as emailing whatever the um, changes they need to us so that we kind of have to, so that we have documentation of that as well. Um, you, the, this person has DBS results available. So it says view your DBS results. Um, the, any, this updates are usually an amendment. And so this individual, um, probably this was done when they had to review the study updates and then decide if they want to participate or not. So what does the results look like on their side? We first always explain, have the explanation up there of what, the, what an antibody test is. We make sure that they understand that this is still a research study, that they should not use this to, to make any decisions, and that they should really be following public health guidelines, regardless of what the results say. Uh, we have a little grid here that explains what the, what um, the dots look like and, and the result that they receive. And um, here is what it looks like. So this individual can see that the blue dots here is everybody else in their age group. And this is um, their result. So this is the, 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 this is uh, uh, the exciting part. Um, exciting, frustrating, frustrating, all of the above. So we submitted in the middle of April, we received our first approval by the 28th of April, but then we had to do a couple of amendments, like a couple of amendments, like I said, to include the age groups that um, for people who were going to be turning 70 that year to ensure that it's only Ontario residents that, 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 that enroll. And and to accommodate for the changing um, uh, vaccine dosing schedules. So by, I think it was, I think it was May 16th or so, the middle of May, we were ready to roll. And I, the first patient enrolled, I believe, or participant, sorry, um, May 19th. And that we started off slowly and there were a couple glitches and our data, our digital team was on the ball and they fixed it rather quickly. And the very first big mistake we made was we released this baby on a weekend. And so the Thursday, I think Zoomer sent out that first email blast. And being excited about this, or my PI and I were sitting and we're glued to our emails to see, because what, was hap what would happen is when somebody enrolls, Stopco at uhn.ca would get an alert that this person enrolled because we needed that alert so, so that we could contact Marketing Kitchen to send out the kits to them. And I think the first day we had like 70 people enroll. And by the weekend, the, our, our emails was just ding, 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 ding. So we had the recruitment rate was, I have never seen this in three months less than actually two and a half, we recruited almost 1300 people. So we met our recruitment, um, uh, uh, product. We, we met what we needed. So as you can see, there was a steep climb um, between the middle of May and the beginning of June where we had almost 400 people. Um, we were just um, on the computer, on, like it, it seemed like we didn't get any sleep whatsoever. And then the phone calls with the questions started coming in. And, you know, my friend wants to, dear, can I get, can I get my friend to participate and so on and so forth. And so, yes, we got, we expected 1250, we got 1286 participants, 375 in the younger cohort and 911 in the, 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 the 
the, the older cohort. The other fascinating um, uh, thing that we discovered was the geography of where in Ontario, we're talking people <laughs> close to the border of Winnipeg, people close to Quebec, that we, we saw places and addresses we didn't even know existed. And I just think it's fascinating and remarkable that with this platform, anybody, because you're not going to have anybody, you know, all the way out here traveling to a facility um, in Toronto to get, to, 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 you know, to do this study or all the way out here and I call it Timbuktu um, to come over here. And so this was just remarkable to us and, 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 and really exciting of the potential of a DCT. So we had 1,286 registered, and so our recruitment was great, but what about the retention? And these, these numbers are still fairly the same today. Um, we, we had 24 who withdrew, uh, five of which withdrew consent um, for whatever reason. Some were unable to do the study task, and that was probably a difficulty mostly with the Lancet. Some couldn't bring themselves to prick their fingers um and so on so we had that we had some difficulty with that um but our retention rate is just really remarkable um there were some people who registered <laughs> who enrolled um from nova scotia so we had to discontinue them because they weren't part of ontario there were some people who um enrolled twice because they weren't sure if it was um, for whatever reason, if it was accepted, maybe their email confirmation went to spam or whatever. So there are a couple of people, not too many who did that. But yeah, 1262, we, we uh, kept in the study and this number is a lot more today, but for the first DBS, um, um, set of DBS samples, we had 1194 that we could, that we sent to the lab and we had, and of that 1106, uh, we, we were able to result and um, process. So this is uh, an overview basically of the demographic of the people that are in our study. And they're mostly female, they're mostly Caucasian. Um, but as you can see, in comparison to the to the younger cohort, yes, there are a lot more comorbidities, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer in comparison to the younger cohort. Um, most people um, were either um, either received Moderna, so an mRNA uh, uh, vaccine, so Moderna or, or Moderna, sorry, or Pfizer, and there's a smattering that received um, um, AstraZeneca. And then, of course, there was the Johnson one, Johnson and Johnson one as well. And so there, there are people who received others. Um, very few, but there were uh, a few that had um, the mixed um, mixed dosing. So they had one mRNA and, and maybe AstraZeneca or something like that. So we were able to analyze that, that information as well. Um, so... Challenges. This is by no this is by no means a comprehensive list. Um, I, I'm sure there's a lot more that we could add, and I've I've alluded to many of them as we were going through. But one of the main challenges for us was the continually changing vaccine re vaccine recommendations. I mean, we had to scramble all the time to make amendments um, to to accommodate for this. Um, uh, another challenge were, was that from the list that of people who agreed to be contacted, we did get quite a few, I mean, not a lot, probably about maybe 100 emails or so of people who did not um, agree to be contacted for whatever reason at different vaccine centers. So we met up, we, we um, made sure that the MOH was aware of that list and there's a link that they have that people can go on and take themselves off that list, which we provided to, to those people who, who reached out to us. Achieving diversity is another challenge in this particular study. As you saw, it was predominantly white, it's predominantly female. Um, and um, that could be um, one with the people who are subscribed to Zoomer, they might be a specific um, population um, demographic. And um, 
and and people might not have um, uh, uh, technological you know, so we can reach them via email. So, uh, it, uh, and the people who signed up to be, who agreed to be contacted again. Uh, so we, that's the, that was one of the challenges that we had achieving diversity. Um, as much as this was incredible, our recruitment rate, it was also a challenge because with recruitment, with the recruitment, we got a lot of phone calls and manning phone calls became not just challenging but exhausting because it was at the time only two of us and then three of us and so on so and it was you know people are just calling over the weekend after hours whenever whenever it's convenient for them and so this is something to consider in the future to make sure you have adequate resources or set specific timelines on when people can reach you and when they can't um, because I think for us, because this was so new, we didn't want to, you know, we wanted to make sure that we, our participants were happy and we didn't want to lose them and we didn't want them to think that we were ignoring their, their, their concerns. Um, but I think going forward, learning from this, I think many of them, they were surprised that we will be, we, we will be responding to them so quickly. So I think many of them are willing to, to wait during normal hours to be responded to within a reasonable time frame. Well, uh, again, because of the incredible recruitment rate, um, at one point we were running out of kits because we didn't want to spend all that money and get all these kits if we didn't recruit anybody. So we had just ordered half at bulk in the beginning and the recruitment rate was so fast and the supply due to the lockdown was so slow that um, we had to kind of, again, adjust. So at the beginning, we were sending people seven kits um, to, to, to last them for the whole study because that would save on, on postage. And then um, over time, we started to mail them two kits so they would have one for at least three months, which would give us three months to send those people the other five. So, so we did have that challenge, but we worked it out. Um, uh, expedited post, as you can see, is in quotes because Canada Post, we sent it via Canada Post expedited. It's supposed to be one to two days. Some people, it was up to two weeks. Um, some people was one week and we knew we sent it out because Marketing Kitchen would send us a list of what was sent out to whom, what their barcode number was, and also the, the tracking. So we could tell participants, listen, it was sent out to you this day, you should be receiving it, it's still in transit, or it was delivered to you, go check again. Digital updates. So over time, with all the changes, with all the amendments, we had to update the platform. And we, on the, the non-digital side, learned about this caching issue. And we learned how to, and to this day, that is the biggest challenge. And so we learned how to teach people how to refresh their, their Mac or their PC or their phone, but we've learned how to do this and talk them through this. So we have a bunch of um, participants out there who are now savvy at refreshing their devices. Lancet challenges. Some people couldn't, the Lancet wasn't sharp enough to poke them. I won't even, I won't even delve into some stories shared with us by our participants, which are a little bit funny and quirky um, on how they went around this. Some people who are diabetic just chose to use their own Lancets, but we did have some um, challenges with the Lancets. So we ordered different types and sent them out um, to the participants. Updating the portals, reminding participants to update the portals. They're good and diligent, men, much, much of them at sending in those specimens, but then we have to remind them to update the portals. And as I said, sometimes we would have to do it on our end because there was a lockout, um, but we kept um, a track, uh, a lock of when we had to do that. Phone and emails I've spoken about. And then lastly, there's a, um, sometimes participants are sitting waiting for the results, but the lab that would, that's processing the results are also processing DBS and samples for other studies as well. So sometimes there's a delay in us getting our um, results to, to, to um, send out to the participants and to analyze. But this is an incredibly rewarding study. And um, 
uh, I, I'm going to quickly wrap up here because we're getting close to the end, but it's very, um, it, we had quick and robust um, recruitment. We had a dedicated set of participants. I don't know how many times with a booster, a new booster coming up, they call us. We don't want to ruin the study there. We want to make sure we're doing this right. Did you receive my sample? Like very dedicated, very motivated. Um, the ability to engage people in research who have never done this before. Um, you know, allowing them to participate from the comfort of their home and beyond. There are many who were snowboard snowboarders, and we got <laughs> we we got postages from Florida sometimes, and they were just incredibly dedicated. Uh, working with the UHN Research Support Service was a bonus. I mean, the turnaround time for us was incredible, and the and working together was uh, um, was very positive. Um, the ability to contribute to the knowledge um, about controlling this pandemic and working with the new collaborators like our data team and um, Marketing Kitchen and so on was very rewarding. So the story continues. We, um, we've extended the study to 96 weeks because of the boosters and um, incredibly almost a thousand people opted to, into the extension study. Subsequently, because of the Omicron, we decided to do a rapid test sub-study where we send them rapid test kits. And I think we have up, um, over 700 who's about 700 participating in that. Um, we were able to quickly accommodate for these additional boosters with our study. And we have also just sent out, because the first set of participants are reaching their 48 week mark, a participant feedback survey, and we sent it out last week and we already have almost 800 people who have responded to this. So I put this triangle up here um, because it is a best practice. You, I, I always have this triangle close to me. It keeps us in check. It, 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 you know, it reminds us that for good quality, we need to consider time. If we can do it in a short amount of time with adequate resources, and with a reasonable scope, we get good quality data. And I believe that we were, we were able to accomplish this with our study. So our best practices is, you know, always go back to your fundamentals. Don't, 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 just because this is new, the fundamentals helps guide you in where to go. Make sure you have adequate resources. You have to be adaptable. Communication is key. Collaboration works when it works well, uh, I, I, you know, uh, and it works in, in, in tandem with communication. And you always have to be in learning mode. And I, I cannot underestimate putting yourself in the shoes of others. The data team, they had one perspective. And so we would come up with things in the beginning to say, OK, this is what we need. It seems like an easy fix. But from the data team, no, it's not an easy fix. But we didn't understand that. So we had to learn that. And from their perspective, OK, yes. Yeah, so a few participants are asking you questions. Why can't it wait uh, you know, four days? And we're saying, no, retention is key. It's not just about recruitment. So they got to understand that. Understanding the languages, um, even putting ourselves in the shoes of the REB, what questions would we ask if we were reviewing this consent form? We were able to create a, a, a very good, I believe, um, electronic consent form. So um, it helps us to build on what you already know. And you, we, you know, you should, we should always try to do that because when we build, because building on what we already know reminds us that, you know, we don't know until we know. And that's the end of my story. I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I think we have five minutes or so, um, please um, feel free to ask them. I'll hand back over to Emily and to the team. Thanks, Rosie. Um, any questions from this group? Oh, yeah, we have uh, Leah. Leah. Sorry, I was just clap doing the virtual clapping. Oh, sorry. <laughs> hand. <laughs> now you got to think of a question. <laughs> I um. Let's see if there's a question here. Um, when Rosie says, put yourself in their shoes, she literally put herself uh, in 
the shoes of the REB because I think you said you joined, um, you participated in some REB activities just so you could really get the perspective of uh, what they would find valuable and and what they needed. So this was this was many 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 years ago. Um, uh, I, I when I just started. I really wanted to understand because it was getting I was getting very frustrated by a lot of the review questions and I couldn't understand where it was coming from and back then you could volunteer to be on the REB board so I did that for a few years to kind of get an understanding of 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 what it what their mindset is and why they think the way they do but that was many many years ago. So. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to ask another question. What what have you done different, or what would you do different if you had to kind of find new enrollment um, to improve diversity? We always think of um, DCTs as that being a you know big check mark that we improve diversity. You obviously got great access and accessibility was achieved um, based on that map. But what would you do different there? I think the first thing, I, and that's why I had that triangle there. Um, it, there's a cost. It, it, there, there's a cost factor that you have to think about, right? Because you you're gonna have to think of different languages. You're gonna have to make sure that your consent is available in not only English, right? So you're gonna have to make sure that um, it's available in different languages and targeting um, certain maybe community groups and organizations who who can reach out to um, different um, populations. So those are two of the things, but that takes time and that takes funding. And with the limited resources that we had, we could only reach, and the time that, that we had, we could only reach out quickly in that, in that setting. Yeah, great. Um, there's two more minutes if anyone has a burning question. I believe that Rosie's open to uh, follow-up questions as well. Um, yeah. We can facilitate that for you. Okay, Heidi. Congrats, Rosie, that was great. Um, kudos to everyone on the team. I'm curious about now that you've extended the study, if you've, you know, given that you had challenges in your resources and timing when you were available to participants, have you shifted in terms of, you know, these are our set hours when we are able to answer questions live, for example. So, no, we've discussed it. We've discussed it numerous times. But I got to tell you that everybody who's taken the phone or answered the emails, it's actually become, they actually enjoy doing it. What we have done though, is if we're doing, if we're launching anything where we anticipate any quest, a lot of questions and so on, we don't do it on a Friday. <laughs> so, and, and what we did was over the long weekend, I mean, from a management perspective and, and, our, and our PI as well, we have offered, so my PI and I, for the, uh, um, with the other coordinators, we, we won't let them take it on the weekend. Sometimes they'll wrestle us for it where we have a great team like that, but we we will take it ourselves. So either my PI will take it or I will take it. Excellent, thank you. And congrats again. Thank you. Okay, that puts us at time. Thank you so much, Rosie. Um, and congratulations for the great success. And thank you for sharing both uh, your challenges and your solutions to those challenges. Really appreciate it. Um, with that, I will just remind you again that there's a survey we'd love to hear from you and we can give you a certificate of attendance if uh, you fill that out and wish you a great day and week ahead. Thanks everyone.